I'm, I'm Mitchell, and this is Armand. Um, we're the two founders of HashiCorp. Uh, we've collectively uh, built sort of everything I'm going to show you and what we're talking about today. So we just got back from HashiConf. It was last week. Um, that's why we have these jackets. <laughs> uh, and uh, we announced a couple new things at HashiConf. So Dio asked us, since we were going to be in town, to come and uh, talk about those things. So we're going to spend the focus of the time talking about what those two things are. Um, given that this isn't a keynoting environment, we get to go in a lot more detail, technical detail, about how things work. So we added a lot more detail, removed uh, a lot of the keynote stuff from the, the presentation. We're going to talk more technical. Um, but to get started, I sort of want to give the, the, the quick overview of what we've done, like the one, two sentence or one paragraph description of everything we've done uh, in the order we've done it and sort of explain why we did it. Uh, and in doing so, lead to these final two, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and that should help explain sort of how they fit in and, and the purpose they have. So uh, we built nine things. Uh, they're listed here over the past six years, I guess. Um, and the first one, which, no, uh, these two are the ones we announced. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so the purpose of building these nine things, our, our goal from the beginning of starting this company, which was three years ago, was to make going from development to production easy. And when, we, when we're talking about development to production, we're not talking about like a Heroku uh, or, or a more limited approach to production, although Heroku is getting more flexible every day. At least you know, three years ago, it was ultra limited. Um, we weren't talking about that. We wanted to actually help very large users get to production, like hobbyists to very large users. So we wanted to build these tools that would, let, that would scale from a hobbyist to, uh, to Fortune 500, basically. So, we started with Vagrant. We had Vagrant to begin with. Um, this is the one that's six years old now. Uh, I think most people here probably know what it is. So um, the development environment tool. And this is where we started from. So we knew this was sort of the starting point of how we had to build tools out. Uh, the, the funny sort of thing that we laugh about today is when we started the company um, and analysts started analyzing us, um, uh, they categorized us as a IDE company. We were, we were uh, a dev tool IDE company. And it was funny to us then because we knew what we wanted to do, um, but we couldn't really talk about it. Uh, and it's funny now just because it's, a, it's really far from the truth. So we started with Vagrant. We were an IDE company, in, <laughs> according to you know, analysts. And we started to push forward. And the first thing we had to do was, it was change this perception and get people comfortable with running our tools in an operator uh, environment and then eventually in data centers, like in the path of downtime eventually. Um, because being just the Vagrant developers, uh, if we just came out with something like console, we would have gotten a lot of skepticism um, in our ability to ship something that could technically cause downtime. So we sort of had to gain trust uh, towards that path. So we, we went in a very sort of calculated order. Um, the next thing we came out with was Packer. Uh, Packer is the tool for creating images, uh, creating sort of immutable images. And when it came out, it could only build uh, machine images like AMIs, VirtualBox images, things like that. Nowadays, it could create containers, and it could also, in the most recent version, create uh, application-level uh, images. So I mean, like jars and Heroku slugs and things like that, like at a finer granularity than a uh, container. And when this came out, people saw it and were like, OK, the Vagrant people created a tool for creating Vagrant boxes. Um, and <laughs> they're, they're not wrong. Uh, that's how we like, purposely sort of advertised it. So we sort of did it to ourselves. Um, but they're not, they're not wrong. But at the same time, there was a much deeper uh, plan here, which was this would be our tool for creating immutable images going forward, and, and it has been. So the next thing we came out with was Surf and then Console uh, within about uh, six months of each other or so. Um, so if you look at Vagrant, it's a developer tool. If you look at Packer, it's, it's kind of an operator tool if you think about it. Um, and then we came out with Surf and Console. When we came out with Surf, I think that's when people got really confused because they suddenly couldn't anchor this to Vagrant in any possible way. Like there just isn't any good reason to have this if you view us as an ID company. So <laughs> Surf came out, and what we were trying to get to was service discovery. And, and in this immutable world where you have things coming up and down uh, really quickly, and, and it's immutable, so they're not, there's no runtime configuration, or it's not easy to do runtime configuration, uh, we needed a tool to do that, and we needed a tool to find these things. So where, how does the web server find the database? Uh, before, you would use something like Chef. Uh, but given that you're running Chef in a compile step rather than just like on demand, it's harder to do that sort of thing unless you want to run Chef twice, um, which is not what we wanted to advocate. So we came out with Surf, um, which then became the building block of console, which you just heard about. Um, and these are both very firmly runtime tools, like production, run in your data center, could cause downtime sort of things. 
Um, and consoles adoption went really well. Uh, we came out, like we didn't plan this, but we came out right at a great time where Docker was taking off and microservices were taking off and suddenly a lot of people had problems that console solved. Uh, so we got lucky there and that caused it to get adopted really quickly and um, Armand worked really hard to make it very stable. So we've to date never had a single data loss incident with console and that sort of stuff even at like a 0 0.1 um, increased the sort of uh, confidence people had in console greatly and so the adoption sort of took off. Um, but this was great for us because it sort of solidified us as being able to make stable production level tools um, and it put us in a really good position. Um, we're still being called like on Twitter and stuff. We still seeing like oh the vagrant people made console like we still were seeing stuff like that but it was getting less and less so uh, things were looking good. Um, next I think oh yeah next was Terraform so this was last year. Actually funny tidbit we, we finished and polished this up in New York like a year ago so we were we were here um, uh, and the DO people were the first people ever to see Terraform actually. Um, uh, so we came we built Terraform next so uh, this is back sort of towards operator tools in a way but this was our tool for building for codifying and building complete data centers uh, with code. So Chef and Puppet and friends try to do something like this, but due to their sort of model of running on the agent, they, they, they are the agent of change on whatever they're running on, it just didn't work right with this cloud service provider control plane model, um, even though they've, they, they, they're, they've tried and they keep trying to do this, but it just doesn't feel right. Um, so we came out with Terraform, which is a way to describe your whole data center, all your regions and text files, and then execute them. So uh, most recently, we used Terraform to load balance Nomad um, uh, on DO, and we were able to spin up thousands of droplets basically in parallel really quickly, and that's sort of what it's good at. Uh, so we came out with Terraform, and I'll explain how all these tie together a little bit later. Um, and at this point, we're pretty, seeing, looking at news, social media, stuff like that, we're pretty firmly suddenly becoming a DevOps company. So it, it was shifting, and things were looking really good. So then this year, we came out with Vault. Uh, Vault is our secret, uh, is our security solution. Um, when it first came out, it was a just a secret management tool, just stored secrets, um, passwords, tokens. Since then, it's evolved in quite a lot more. Um, it's now a fully uh, self-run uh, CA or PKI system, so it could be your CA. It could generate certs. It could uh, give those out. Um, it could do uh, it could do all sorts of stuff now. That's all security related. It's the tool that is meant to secure everything else. So. That came out uh, earlier this year, um, and that then became our, at the time, fastest growing tool ever. Um, in terms of vanity metrics, within uh, the first month, it had 3,000 stars. Um, it's been out six months, and uh, like not able to talk specifics. Uh, basically, I like to say, like if you've, if you've used non-cash forms of money or traded stock recently, uh, you've touched this thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's really crazy for a tool that's six months old that's like security. It's a very scary thing. It not only causes downtime, it causes like brand damage if that thing gets messed up. So um, the amount of trust we've been able to get to get this thing out um, is great and it's audited now. So uh, it's, it's, it's verified secure by other people, but who knows. Um, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, but yeah, it's doing really well. So then uh, this week, or it, kind of, like seven days ago, um, we announced two things. So the first is Nomad. This is what we're going to go into detail about today. Nomad is our application uh, scheduler. Um, it schedules Docker containers, scheduled VMs, other things. We're going to talk about that. And this was critical to split the immutability into two layers. So basically, uh, machine level and application level. If you, if you only have machine level, deploys kind of suck. They, you have to build a whole image every single code change, and that takes minutes. It's, we're on the scale of minutes. You have to orchestrate starting new machines, stopping new machines. Uh, it's just not a great experience, although it's workable. So we wanted to split that into an application level, or application level immutability so that you could build the image relatively infrequently, or the machine image relatively in infrequently, and then do the application one very frequently, maybe a dozen times per day, where the deploy is now on the order of milliseconds rather than minutes. Uh, and that's what we came out with. And then the last thing we came out with is auto uh, and auto is quite a bit different than the rest, so um, I'll just hold off on talking about that. So this is sort of the one diagram we like to show of how things fit together um, in, in, a, in a loose way. So the, I, the sort of vision we had for how these things would all work together is you start in Vagrant, which is your development environment. You then use Packer to build the machine image it's running on or the application level image that will get deployed. So we use Packer to build both uh, 
uh, AMIs or, or droplet base images, as well as um, Docker containers, jars, things like that. Um, from there, depending on what type of image you make, it goes, it branches. So if you made a machine image, it's going to go to Terraform. Terraform's going to launch new machines, get rid of the old ones, try to do this with minimal downtime. It has various tools for doing that. Um, but if you built an application level thing like a container, it's going to go out to Nomad, which is scheduling it onto your hopefully Terraform managed cluster. Um, the arrow there between Nomad and Terraform is because uh, Nomad knows things like your CPU pressure uh, is really high on this machine, or w w there's, too much, there's too much pressure, I can't schedule new jobs because there's just not enough capacity, I need more capacity, please tell Terraform. Terraform knows how to spin up more capacity so it could scale your cluster. Um, this isn't built into to auto, uh, to Nomad and Terraform right now, but that's what we're doing right now, and that's sort of how they fit together. Um, and then both of these things just tie into console. So Terraform is spinning up uh, nodes that are registering with console. So we could see every uh, Nomad agent or, or anything else in console. And then Nomad is scheduling jobs, application level jobs that are also registering in the console. So you could, you could ask, like using the data from Terraform, we could say where are the Nomad agents? And using the data from Nomad, you could actually be like, where is my application? Um, so you get both that data in console. Uh, floating out here is Vault. Um, Vault is sort of used by everything, and putting arrows to everything doesn't work. So, um, you know, Vagrant is probably the least likely one to use Vault, perhaps, but you could get some credentials from there. Um, Packer uses Vault pretty heavily to get um, AWS credentials, DigitalOcean credentials. Uh, Terraform uses it heavily for the same purpose. Uh, Nomad doesn't integrate yet, but eventually Nomad will integrate with Vault in uh, a much different way, which is to uh, give each application an identity, like a verified identity. If you trust Vault, if you trust Vault and Nomad uh, tells Vault that this application is who, who it is and it could talk to the API, then, then you have sort of trust in your network. So um, Vault will do a lot more there. Uh, and then Vault is sort of secret storage that is backed by console. The, the data storage for Vault uh, can go into console as, as well as Zookeeper and other things. So uh, that's how it all fits together. And then you might notice around this in the little corner is Otto, the, the little robot. And uh, we'll talk about how that all is. But basically, you can imagine that if you're trying to build a development to production workflow, uh, learning uh, five, oh wait, no, six tools is pretty complicated. So Otto is really the, the meta tool we've tried to build in order to simplify this whole thing and manage this whole thing for you. Uh, but we'll talk about how we do that later. And then the last one, which uh, wasn't mentioned this whole thing, is Atlas, and that's because it's our commercial product. It actually gives you that whole thing. And, and how that relates to Auto, I just want to show here. So the idea is that Auto is the open, it, Auto, it, it, Auto is like what Git is to GitHub. So Auto to Atlas is like Git to GitHub. And the idea there is workflow, not, not tech related. Obviously, Auto is not a version control system. But the idea is that Auto is your open source workflow to um, develop, deploy, get all, everything done from just a CLI. Um, and you need Atlas to do collaboration, to do uh, uh, interfaces, security, things like that. And it's, it's very much similar to the relationship between Git and GitHub. So that's all the tools we've built so far. Um, and next, I sort of just want to pass it off to Armand, who's going to talk about Nomad, why we built it, what it could do, and its architecture as well. to go into technical details, so this will be more fun. Um, so Nomad, what is it? Uh, as Mitchell said, it's kind of it's an application scheduler. Uh, what does that really mean? Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the space, basically the idea is it's a single system that kind of pools the resources of your whole data center together. So whether you have 10 machines, 100 machines, 1,000 machines, it kind of makes it look like a single, very large machine. Um, think about almost like your CPU scheduler on your operating system. You don't really think like my process is running on this core. It just kind of spreads things around everywhere and gives you the abstraction of it's one whole thing. So it does that same sort of thing and it gives you an API above that to be just push jobs into it. So you push jobs into its single API and it manages placing it all over you know, your very large fleet of machines. And the idea really, the goal of doing it isn't just to add complexity. Uh, it's to be able to easily deploy applications. So you no longer have to think about like where, which machine is it running on. You know, if it's a Linux-based job, am I accidentally running it on a Windows machine or vice versa? You know, does that machine have enough memory and CPU and disk to actually run my thing? You basically declare all of your requirements, and you know, the, the enforcement and logical parts of making sure 
none of those are violated, live with a nomad. So as a developer, it kind of frees you from all of this. You just tell it, this is what I want to have happen, and you don't really care how it has to happen. And the way to make this actually possible is this job specification. So you have to specify to Nomad what you want it to run, what the shape of that thing is, those kind of details. So what does this actually look like? Uh, so we use this thing that we call basically the, the job specification. So this is a really exa simple example one. It's actually not that simple. This is you know, a fully runnable real, real world example. And we'll come back to, in a second, what the specifics of these things mean. But really what I want to show is that it's a very high level, like human readable, easy to read, easy to write. You throw comments in there. It's not a very low level specification. It's meant to be read and written by developers on a day-to-day -day basis. And the idea behind it is, like I said, to really allow a developer just to declare what they want to have run. Um, and then all of the like, details of you know, which machine it's running on, how do I run it there, how do I monitor it, how do I service discover it, how do I connect it to Vault and have security around this kind of thing. Those are all details that are left to the scheduler. You don't have to think about it as a developer. You just told it what you needed it to run. And so the where and how is left to the, to the system itself. And so one of the reasons we took this approach, if you've ever played with something like Terraform, is we're really huge fans of this kind of declarative language. Because the power behind it is we can make these very simple high-level specifications where the, all of the features can basically be hidden, the complexity of how it's implemented, the complexity of like, OK, you changed the definition of your application. How do I do a rolling deploy now? So if it was a very imperative kind of code where you said, OK, first app get installed this thing, then app get installed this thing, then doing a rolling upgrade is very hard. There's, it's very hard for the system to tease apart the how of something versus the intention of what you're trying to do. So by just giving us the intention, we can do a lot of very interesting, powerful things around the how of it. So going back to that exact same job file, I want to kind of decompose the different bits of this and show what I mean by that kind of like hiding a lot of power there. So the first thing is just defining the job itself. So here we're just naming a Redis job. A job has a name just to kind of group it and so you can logically kind of talk about it with the API. Um, so it's just giving it an arbitrary name. The second line is we're specifying the data center we want to run in. So here we're just saying US East 1. And so this looks like a really simple line, but underneath this, there's actually a full multi-region, multi-data center model. So if I wanted my job to span two different data centers, I could just throw in US West 1 in there. Or if I wanted to span AWS and DigitalOcean, I say US East 1, SFO 1, New York City 3, Amsterdam 4, whatever. Now it's the scheduler's problem to figure out how do I do a multi-cloud, multi-data center deployment. Right? As a developer, I don't care. I just put some strings in there, and it's the scheduler's problem, basically. And so it's only a single line, very easy to read, but there's a lot of power in making that actually possible. Then we move down a little bit, and we get to the actual tasks. So a task is the real unit of work in Nomad. There's basically a one-to-one -one mapping you can think about between a task and your application. And a task really has a few things. One is it needs you know, the application to actually run. So how do I actually run this application? And the other is the set of resources that app is going to consume. So every task has to have these two things. So here we're defining a pretty simple set of resource utilization. We're saying, give me about a half of a CPU, 200 megs of RAM, 10 megabits of network. And by the way, give me a, dynamically assign a port to me. So we're not asking for port 80 or port 6379. We're saying, you know, on the machine you're going to pick, of its 65,000 ports, give me one that's free and reserve that just for my application. The other side of this is then specifying what we actually want to run. So in this case, we're saying, OK, we're going to run the Red, uh, Redis latest image and use this Docker driver. So this driver piece, again, looks very simple. But underneath that, there's actually a lot of kind of interesting functionality we can talk about. And similarly here, the resources, you know, not only the point of this isn't just you know, for documenting how many resources we need. Nomad will actually reserve that resource and find a machine that has enough space for us to run. So it's not going to place us on a machine that doesn't have enough memory or doesn't have enough CPU. We're going to guarantee that you actually have enough resources to run your application. And we'll reserve it so another application doesn't come and take up your resources. But then going into the drivers, there's a lot of kind of interesting features there. So here we had just said, hey, just run this Docker image for me. But underneath that, Nomad actually has the flexibility to run kind of multiple drivers. And the idea is that we want to be able to support any type of containerized, virtualized, or kind of any real application sort of workload. So there it was just, OK, I have a Dockerized application. My organization already packages everything. Great, you just specify type as Docker and let the Docker driver spin it up. But there's a lot of applications, for example, Vault, that still benefit, benefit from hardware virtualization. Right? Uh, you know, container security has improved pretty dramatically in the last year or two. 
uh, but still the kind of hardware level isolation you get from virtual, virtual memory and kind of hardware level pr protection is still higher. So if you're running any sort of security sensitive application, you probably still want to run it inside of a VM. Or if you're a public cloud that's running VMs as a service, you know, uh, they talked only briefly a bit before, but DO in some sense has a scheduler as well. So you can almost imagine providing an internal cloud to your company where you know, you're buying bare metal, but you're exposing VMs. And so the scheduler doesn't care. It's just you're asking for another slice of allocation of a machine. So you can express that as a virtualized workload. And the last set of kind of interesting workloads are these kind of standalone applications. And so for a lot of things like Java, for example, when you compile it, you end up with a jar file, basically, that has all of the class files, all of the assets, everything you need to run your application, minus the JVM. So for something like a Java jar, there's really very little benefit to recontainerizing it. Java's already containerized everything into a jar. You're just rewrapping it again in another layer, basically. So in Nomad's world, you don't actually need to do that. You don't need to express it as a Docker container. You can just say, I have this jar file. Find a machine that has Java installed, and just go run it there, basically. I have already containerized it in the form of a jar. Another example of this is how Google does you know, their data centers, which is compile everything as a static binary. So if I take my C++ application, or you know, any application really, and I compile it into a single enormous static binary, you know, instead of a two meg hello world, I bring in libc and libxml and everything that I need, and I have a 50 megabyte binary, I don't depend on anything from the kernel anymore. I expect the syscall layer and everything else I've already compiled in. So again, there's really no benefit to me to rewrap it and bring the operating system with me. I've already compiled everything in. So in Nomad's world, you say, here's my static binary. Just find a machine you know, that can run this thing, basically. And there's no need to rewrap it again. So you know, if you're moving towards Docker and you're, that's what you've standardized on, great. If you're somewhere else on that spectrum and it doesn't make sense for you, then the goal for Nomad is to be able to have that flexibility to run whatever workload you have. So those were kind of just the initial set that we wanted to launch with. So 01 shipped with Docker, QEMU, Java, and static binaries. Um, but there's a whole host of things we want to be able to bring in. So in FreeBSD world, they have uh, Jetpack, which is like their version of Docker. Windows is bringing Windows Server containers. Um, in the virtualized world, you know, Zen is still huge. Hyper-V on Windows is huge. Uh, and things like C Sharp can also compile down into a single executable, which is self-contained. It only depends on the CLR. So as long as the CLR is there, you're good to go, basically. And so kind of the initial set of things um, that, that we wanted to kind of target was really making this application deployment process for developers as easy as possible. Um, and along the way, we wanted to make sure we support Docker as a first class citizen of this world, makes it really easy for organizations that are already Dockerizing things to now schedule at enormous scale. Multi-data center and multi-region was a huge requirement for us, um, just kind of the kind of customers we talked to. Multi-data center isn't kind of the like future scenario, it's like it's the default scenario for them. Uh, and then when you start talking about disaster recovery, multi-region or multi-cloud provider uh, is also just a practical reality for a lot of these guys. So it just had to be there out of the box. Uh, flexible workloads. Again, we work with a lot of people who they have tens of thousands of applications, and it's not practical for them to re dockerize everything or do a kind of an end migration. Uh, they have to be able to say, you know, this set of applications is virtualized and is going to be virtualized for the next five years. So how do we still airlift those things into the scheduler without forcing you to retool everything, basically? Uh, bin packing, you just kind of get that for free. So the thing we didn't even talk about, which is one of the biggest strengths of a scheduler, is maximizing density and resource utilization. So on average, uh, most servers, you know, it depends on company, but you know, somewhere between 5 to 20% utilization, which the flip side of that means you have something between 80 and 95% of your compute wasted. So because we're specifying the exact amount of resources we need on a per task basis, you know, the goal with Nomad is maybe not to get you to 100%, but at least can we get to 80% utilization or 90% utilization. So instead of talking about 95% of resources being wasted, we're talking about 10% of resources being wasted. So in some large scale organizations, you're talking about tens of thousands of machines that can actually be shedded uh, and no longer need to be managed and dealt with. And really, all of these features, although each one sounds pretty complex, we saw what that actually looked like in the HL specification. It fit on a page. That one spec did Docker, did multi-data center. It supported multiple workloads. It was doing bin packing, and it was like 10 lines of code. right? So by having this very high level specification, we're not sacrificing a lot in terms of complexity for developers. And so really, when we thought about Nomad, and when we think about really any one of our tools, um, our kind of design approach at HashiCorp is how do we look at what is in the market or what tools or solutions exist to a problem and 10x that, and try and 10x that in every kind of category we can. 
And so when we went to look at kind of the scheduler space, the application delivery space, you know, there was three distinct categories that we saw where you know, could, we could improve upon. One was the ease of use for developers. A lot of these tools are pretty challenging to learn, pretty challenging to use. The tooling is just not intuitive. The other is on the operation side. So some of these tools are simple for developers, but really challenging for our actual operators to operate at scale in an HA environment where they care about security across regions. Right? The operational challenges are extreme for some of these. And the last one is then building for scale. Right? Like it had to support tens of thousands of machines um, just because you know, it's cute if we can solve it for you know, the 10 node, 100 node scale, but really the extreme challenges for doing application delivery exist at that 10,000 node scale. And so how do we tackle that? And I think we've done a pretty good job, as we'll kind of talk about with each of these, trying to get there. So the ease for, of de use for developers really comes from that job specification we talked about. So that simple file is pretty much that is the way developers interact with the system. They write job files, they edit job files, they read job files, but that's kind of the end of their interaction. Um, where they do need to actually kind of interface with the system is you know, typically in testing, in development mode, you actually have to submit the job to make sure you know, does it have a syntax error? Does it work? Will it schedule at all? Am I going to get an error back from the scheduler? So one thing we wanted to optimize for uh, is basically adding a special dev mode. So here I've just added a special flag. I'm saying nomad agent dash dev. And this just automatically spins up a scheduler just for development. So it doesn't persist in any state. It goes from you know, hitting enter to being fully running in about a second. And it's a full scheduler. You have the scheduler, the server side component. You have the client side component where you can actually schedule and run work and the normal API. So now a developer can use their CLI, they can submit jobs to it, they can develop against the tool. If you're building higher level interfaces and tooling that can consume the API, there you go, you have the full API. And it's incredibly easy to like actually spin it up. It's not a lot of like, how do I hack this thing into a development mode? But it wouldn't be, you know, it, it'd be kind of, it, it's great if it's easy for our developers and it's one flag and then it's like when you actually want to operationalize it, it's a super nightmare. Um, so really, it's a tool designed for production in the same way console is, in the same way surf is, in the same way vault is. And so we wanted to get it to be as operationally simple as we've done with things like console. So just the similar sort of story as console, we ship only a single binary. So whether it's the client that's actually running the tasks in which you'll have tens of thousands of them, or whether it's the servers that are the control plane of the system and you only have three, five, seven of them, it's just a single binary. You're just changing the flags that go each one. So the developer might be running dash dev, and it's acting as both a client and server. In production, you'd very likely never configure it that way and say, I have my three servers, I have my 1,000 clients. But it's just one binary. You don't really have to worry about it. Same configuration syntax and everything. Uh, yeah. So on the operation side, we'll come back a little bit to its architecture. It should be it's single binary, simple configuration, really easy to get it going. Uh, the building for scale part was more, more interesting. So you know. In some sense, we, we had the kind of advantage going in that we have a lot of experience building very large-scale distributed systems at this point. Uh, we started with Surf. It was kind of our first production-oriented tool. It's a completely decentralized peer-to-peer -peer gossip system. It's designed to operate at massive scale. It powers the San Diego Supercomputing Center. Um, and you learn a lot of interesting things about the kind of bizarre things like ARP, ARP storms and like, oh, yeah, you only really realize that we have tens of thousands of machines trying to ARP with one another, like what that does to your network routers. So you learn a lot by building something like console, I'm sorry, surf, operating at large scale, figuring out like what weird edge cases you run into as you're scaling into the tens of thousands of machines. And then that code base matures. Like as we've been running this thing, as it's run at ever larger scale, those fixes get incorporated in there and that code base has, has matured now for two or three, two years, I guess now. On the flip side, we have console. Console is kind of a weird hybrid in some sense. It embeds surf, so it brings in a lot of the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer gossip side of things. So it still gets to run and kind of torture test that thing at scale. Uh, but it also has a centralized consensus algorithm. So it's built on Raft, um, which is kind of a derivative of Paxos. And you know, those systems are notoriously hard to get right. Um, you know, strong consistency is one of these things that's really, really nice as an abstraction for a developer and really, really difficult to actually provide as an abstraction to a developer because we're operating in a distributed world under failures and cloud environments where networks come and go, machines come and go. So having, something, having these libraries inside console has really allowed us to refine that both in terms of the stability, the performance. You know, in, in its short lifespan, we've never actually had a data corruption problem. We've never like had a violation of uh, our strong consistency. Um, but we have learned a lot about edge cases and kind of 
you know, error messages, the things you might run into, and refine that over time. So really, we got to start with these two as our building blocks going into Nomad. So we had this very mature consensus library. We had this very mature peer-to-peer -peer gossip thing. And these are really awesome building blocks to have when you're building a distributed scheduler. But we didn't want to just you know, build it just on that and kind of postulate what's the best design for a scheduler. And like, you know, it's a very challenging space itself. So in the same way we kind of read what the state of the art was in academia and in research before building those two tools, we did the same thing with Nomad. Um, and a lot of it is based on really three different papers. One is Google Borg, one is Google Omega, and the other one is Berkeley Sparrow. So these three are kind of the, the heart of the design patterns we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit in Nomad. Um, but the goal was really to deliver a state-of-the-art scheduler. Right? It should be based on the latest in, you know, in cutting-edge research, and really who better to learn from than doing uh, cutting-edge scheduling than Google. Right? No, one, no one really does it at the same scale. So what does the system actually look like architecturally? Um, if you've ever looked at the console diagram uh, for a single data center, it's going to look very similar to Nomad's regional architecture. So Nomad makes a new kind of hierarchy. Um, in the console model, each data center was kind of the unit that you cared about. It was your failure isolation domain. And when I say data center, I mean you know, a grouping of machines that are probably in the same you know, physical region that sh are less than 5 to 10 milliseconds apart on the network. And the problem with this is you have a lot of people who have many data centers uh, that are relatively small, maybe only have you know, 10, 20, 50 machines. And so you know, a lot of people complain to us, hey, I don't want to run five different console servers for my 10 servers that I have here. The overhead is huge. So with Nomad, we had a chance to kind of split this and introduce the concept of a region. So a region is now a collection of multiple data centers. And so you might have you know, SFO1, New York City 1, New York City 2, and these are each data centers, and group them into a larger United States region. So now in Nomad's land, we have basically regional control servers. So you might deploy the three servers in New York City 1, and then you have clients in SFO, New York, whatever, Miami, it doesn't matter. And so now there's a split. The control plane is kind of done at a larger scope. And within that particular region, our clients don't really talk to each other. They're doing remote procedure calls to our servers. Our servers internally are doing leader elections. So one of our servers kind of becomes the, the master and provides additional coordination for the system. We'll talk about that in a second. And among themselves, they're replicating data, forwarding requests. This is all done transparently, so a user doesn't really have to know, am I talking to a server? Am I talking to a client? Am I talking to the leader server? They just make the API request to any of the endpoints, and the request properly does multi-hop forwarding. So then there's a multi-region design as well. So we might have our US region, which spans you know, three different data centers. And then we might have an EU region, that spans whatever, FR1, UK1, GE1. And so we have a separate regional control plane for that. Um, again, from a user perspective, we didn't want them to have to think, oh, OK, if I'm submitting a job to EU, I talk to this endpoint. If I'm submitting it to the US, I talk to this endpoint. You just submit to any endpoint that is Nomad, and it will follow the right routes. So maybe I'm sitting in my SF office. I submit a job to UK. What happens is I hit my you know, US regional servers. The US regional servers are communicating with all of the other servers over the gossip network and know, OK, I'm going to go forward you to a server sitting in the UK now. So they will automatically do the forwarding. The, the job will start running in that region, and the response will basically unwind and go back to the client. So the client doesn't really have to care who they're talking to. And in this way, each of these is now a failure isolation domain. So even if I lose a majority of my servers in the EU, <clears throat> everything continues functioning in the US. I can submit new jobs. Things are still scheduling. This is kind of my failure isolation domain. So the nice part of this design is you can kind of pick and choose what granularity makes sense for your company as a failure domain. So by default, out of the box, we actually configure uh, Nomad to have a single global region. So you might say, you know what? It's OK for me if, for, you know, in the unlikely case three of my five servers are down, I can't schedule any job in any data center all over the world. I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, I'm just going to deploy five servers and you know, hopefully don't lose three of them. That's fine. A single region can handle tens of thousands of machines. If you decide it's completely unacceptable, every data center must be its own failure isolation domain. Hell, every cage has to be its own failure isolation domain. You can set it up that way. You can set up each region to be one region per data center and federate them all together. And that way, if New York City 1 goes down, SFO 1 is still operating as normal. So you can kind of design it around the risk tolerance of your organization. And so in this, we needed to support a lot of flexibility. It wasn't enough to say, like, OK, well, no, no one will have more than two regions, right, like A and B. 
it was like, because there's so much flexibility, we really have to support an arbitrary number. So if we're picking an arbitrary number, let's just say thousands. Um, and since we're building it on the same kind of gossip network that we know works at the tens of thousands, even low hundreds of thousands, it's not a problem, right? That's what it's built on. It can handle that scale of region federation. Within each region, we really wanted to support tens of thousands of clients. And the goal here was, if your risk profile matches it, you should be able to run a single global region, because why not, right? Like, let's just run one set of schedulers. It's good enough for the whole world. Uh, and so realistically, the number of clients that actually are going to have more than tens of thousands of, of machines, relatively low. So if that's kind of the design threshold, great. We can actually have a global region, and you just run one set of schedulers for you know, the entire planet. And then within each region, the you know, thousands of jobs just was a requirement, right? Like we talked to folks that have tens of thousands, and so like they're going to have region splitting issues, right? Because, you know, hopefully we get it to the point where tens of thousands is reasonable. Um, but yeah, we wanted to be able to very easily say, yeah, submit thousands of jobs, you know, millions of tasks, whatever. It should just work. And so this is a section we didn't actually get to talk about during the keynote for lack of detail. How do you actually make this possible, and where where does some of the inspiration from Google uh, leak in? And so one of the particularly interesting design points of Nomad is that it's one of, you know, it might actually be the only optimistically concurrent scheduler that's open source. And what does that actually mean? What, I'm, what it means is that in most systems, let's say I have three different servers, they do a leader election, and then they serialize. One server is going to do all of the scheduling decisions, right? It's very pessimistic. It's going to say, maybe if the other servers are also trying to schedule, they're going to make decisions that conflict with me. So pessimistically, let's exclude them from the scheduling process as the leader, I'm going to decide everything. And the problem with that is if I have one server, or three servers, or seven servers, I get the exact same amount of scheduling throughput, right? It's just whatever that one machine can actually schedule. My other servers you know, are kind of useless. They just sit there, basically. They just replicate data. Where in our design, we're like, OK, how do we actually put these other servers to work? How do we make sure that not only are you increasing your replication factor, but you're adding throughput, that they shouldn't just be idle and sitting there? And part of this was really to support this kind of thousands of jobs and tens of thousands of clients, right? There is just a limit to how much work one machine can do. So how do we ensure the other folks are participating? And so before we dive into how we actually make it optimistically current, it's, it's better to understand kind of the data model uh, within Nomad. It's relatively simple. There's basically two kind of external inputs to the system. One is kind of the client node. This is something that is a schedulable kind of target, basically. So, you know, this is a server, basically. So a node might be in data center one. It has four cores, 100 gigs of RAM, some disk and network, whatever. It's some unit of capacity, basically. And it has some capabilities. So maybe it has Java installed. Maybe it has Docker installed. It exposes that up to the central server. So they kind of know what can this node do. Then the other input is from the developers. So node's input is kind of implicit. You don't really configure a node. It just intrinsically has a set of resources. A job on the other side is configured. This is the main input into the system. So this is you know, provided by a user. It changes over time. They're updated and deleted. The system has to react to that. Nodes similarly are joining, leaving, failing, right? like hardware fails. The two pieces that are internal to the system are evaluations and allocations. So it's important to understand these two as we go into the next slide. An evaluation is created basically any time the external world changes. So you submit a new job. You modify a job. You delete a job. Or a node comes up, a node fails, right? There's a transition basically in what Nomad currently knows and what the external world is basically doing. So how do we reconcile that? Nomad creates an evaluation to say, oh, I need to evaluate the difference between what I think the world looks like and what the world actually looks like. And then the mapping, kind of the join table between jobs and nodes are in the form of allocations. So an allocation is quite literally an allocation of work. So this job specifies I should run Redis, allocate Redis to node one. Okay, so node one now basically can query what work is allocated to me. Oh, okay, Redis, I need to run that. So this is its fundamental data model. It's relatively simple. So like I said, evaluations roughly map to any time there's a state change in the world. So you can imagine, you know, maybe my developers are really only changing my job file once a second. That's maybe an extreme example. I don't know why you'd update things that often. Um, but the other type of state change, node failures or node joins, these are happening at machine scale. Things just fail. And especially if you have tens of thousands, these can be relatively common. right? They don't actually have to be a machine failure. The switch of that rack fails. So now 40 machines fall off the network at the same time, basically. So there's a lot of state change that is possible at large scale. So really, the goal of then any of these evaluations that are created is to modify the set of allocations in the system. 
So allocations are basically the assignment of work, the mapping of like, this is the set of work I have to do. I need to map that onto the set of machines that I can surely do work. So once the state of the world changes, I have to figure out, OK, do I need to update my mapping? Do I need to create new mappings because there's a new job? Do I need to move mappings because a node just failed? Or do I need to destroy allocations because that job doesn't exist anymore? A user decided they're not running Redis anymore. So this is kind of the goal of an evaluation. And so a scheduler, in some sense, is that mapping function. This function that takes an evaluation and generates a set of allocation updates, you can call that essentially a scheduler. Right? It's applying some set of business logic into modifying allocations. So this is going to get a little, it's going to get into a bit of detail now. So this is, the, this is the fun slide. This is my favorite slide that I didn't get to talk about. In some sense, this plays out kind of the, the optimistically concurrent core of the system. So at the very top here, we see kind of, you know, in kind of dashed lines, updates to the system. These aren't kind of like, these are just events that might occur. So a job got registered, a job was updated, a node failed, whatever. These are things that are happening external to the system. What Nomad does is then create a, an evaluation anytime one of these things happens. So in a job register case, the API call that's made is like, whatever v1 jobs put to that endpoint. So the user created a job, and underneath, it both updated the job record and injected a new evaluation into the system. All of these evaluations then get enqueued into a central broker. So this is what I meant with that leader has additional coordination responsibilities. You probably can't read the small print here, but it says leader under there. So there's only a single evaluation broker in the whole system. It's just effectively, if you've ever worked with a Redis task queue or RabbitMQ or any messaging queue kind of a system, it's almost a first in, first out queue of evaluations. You know, priority systems are built right into the heart of Nomad. So you know, if I schedule a job at priority 100 and there's 1,000 jobs sitting at priority 50, I get to jump to the front of the queue and run first, basically. So this kind of brokering happens in a central location. And its goal is to ensure at least once delivery. So we need, you know, in any queue system, you have two choices, at most and at least once. So we need at least the scheduler to respond one time to dealing with an evaluation. It's this thing's job to make sure it gets delivered. So then we have some number of servers, right? Maybe I have five servers running. Each of my servers has eight cores. So I have 40 different kind of scheduler threads that are available in the system. Each of these threads are polling to dequeue work, or I should say they're, they're kind of blocking to dequeue work. They're waiting for stuff to be pushed to them. Uh, so each of the servers basically dequeues an evaluation and ingests it into a different scheduler function. So the system has this kind of notion of pluggable schedulers, that function that you might want to use to figure out what your mapping is is different depending on your workloads. So at the core of it, there's two that we ship with. And there's no way anyone can read this but me. One of these is the service scheduler. So if I'm running a long-lived service, for example, Redis. You know, I don't expect to you know, start Redis and 10 minutes later it finishes. I expect to start Redis and it runs forever. So there's a lot of considerations you want to make if you're scheduling a service because it will live forever and it's hard to move. Right? Once my service accumulates state, I can't just kill Redis and move it. I mean, I can, but it's lossy. right? So what I'd rather do is pay a lot of attention when I'm making this decision and run very expensive kind of computations to figure out, am I running two Redises on the same machine, on the same rack, on the same cage, on the same core router? How do I kind of isolate the kind of correlated failure that can occur with my services? With one Redis, you know, that's not so interesting. But let's say, let's say I'm scheduling web servers, right? An absolutely terrible placement strategy if I said I want 40 web servers is if the scheduler puts all 40 web servers on the same rack. Because now I lose a single top of rack switch, and my entire service takes an outage. Right? The correlated failure of all of those instances was very, very high. So for something like a service scheduler, you care deeply about these kind of things. You, don't, you want to spread across your data center. You want to isolate you know, the damage that random failure will do to your service. Where something like a batch scheduler, I'm saying, run a MapReduce job. I have 10,000 mappers. I don't really care. I don't really expect any of them to live more than five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes at the outside. And should it fail, I just schedule it again. It's like, just run it again. I don't care. Right? So it's, doesn't, it's not as sensitive to failure, because you don't, it's not damaging. You lose 20 minutes of work at most versus something like my web servers. A total service outage is pretty damning. And then you might imagine you have custom scheduler logic for whatever reason. Uh, you need to write your own scheduler with your own specialized thing for your organization. That's possible as well. So a lot of this architecture comes from the Google Omega model of supporting, hey, how do we have enough flexibility in our scheduler that we can target different workload cases and make sure we can fit that logic in? So great, we have these different schedulers. Maybe we have 40 different threads that are making progress on evaluations at once. How do we actually make sure that you know, the scheduler doesn't do insane things like, say, I'm going to put all 40 of the allocations onto you know, web one? 
or node 1. Well, the way they do it is they don't actually create allocations directly. There's a layer of indirection. So again, the leader is the one providing the coordination here. So when, these, when the actual scheduler decides to make a change, either creating allocations, modifying, deleting allocations, they create a plan. They don't actually just do it right away. So what they'll do is they'll create an allocation plan, and they'll submit it into the plan queue. So similarly, this is now the inverse of the evaluation broker. All of the different servers are pushing into the single queue and saying, hey, please apply my set of changes that I care about. And again, on this side, the leader's providing the coordination. It's using a priority queue system internally. So if my job, you know, priority 100 job comes in and you know, there's a bunch of work sitting at priority 50, I'm going to get first access to resources, basically. My plan jumps to the front of the queue. So now our leader dequeues these things one at a time and looks at the plan and checks, OK, you want to put you know, you know, web machine over here, Redis machine over here. Are you violating any constraints of the system, basically? Right? So if you imagine I started with a blank slate and I had one gig of you know, memory, first job came in and took half of that, second job came in and took the other half. If a third job tries to get placed on the same machine, it must be rejected because we've overcommitted the resources. And because these guys are making decisions in parallel, one, two, and three might say, yeah, I need 512 megs of RAM on the exact same machine. So when these three plans get ingested here, plan number one will get approved. That will go back to the server and say, yep, great, your 500 meg allocation succeeded. Plan number two, again, same thing. Plan number three, the plan queue says, oh, nope, sorry, you've actually picked a machine that's overcommitted. So now the scheduler will receive a plan result back that basically says, of your 20 allocations or your 2,000 allocations you tried to make, 950 succeeded. And here, the rest of the remaining, whatever, 50 failed. You need to make a new decision. And so now the server is free to implement the logic to basically try again, pick a different set of machines. And hopefully, and this is where the optimism comes in, hopefully the second time around it doesn't conflict. So the first time around, 950 out of 1,000 succeed. Second time around, you know, maybe 49 succeed. Third time around, the last one succeed. And now the evaluation is done. So the leader is then the only one who's actually modifying the state. So this coordination that's happening within the plan queue and the evaluation broker are critical for maintaining the integrity of the system itself. Um, but at the same time, these are very expensive functions to be running, right? Like these things may chew away at things for hundreds of milliseconds to figure out where do I place a thousand Hadoop tasks, right? Like the, or where do I put my 500 web servers, right? It's a very expensive function, it's not instant. So we don't want to just run it on our one leader. So this is kind of the heart of it. I hope that was uh, somewhat interesting for people other than me. <laughs> <laughs> And so if, you, if you're interested in this kind of style, this kind of architecture, s highly recommend the Google Omega paper. It basically describes very much of this style of thing. Um, theirs has a little more flexibility uh, in, in the kind of its implementation for various, various reasons that make more sense for, for their kind of environment that they're in. But nonetheless, this kind of separation of um, constraint management and coordination provided by a single leader uh, from the distinct kind of computation and optimistic concurrency of the schedulers themselves is kind of pioneered by, by Google's work. And so you know, we've talked a lot about wanting to build the system that is designed for scale and you know, operationally pleasant and yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know, so at some point, you want to test that it works. right? And so the problem is when you're building a system that's designed for scale, you, you need those machines. right? You can't just spin up a virtual machine and be like, just pretend this is 10,000 machines. Because right? it doesn't work very well when it tries to run 10,000 containers on your machine. And so we worked with some friends at DigitalOcean to be like, hey, can you guys give us a bunch of free money and spin up machines for us? <laughs> and they were kind enough to do so. So we spun up three servers in the New York City 3 region, and then 100 clients in both New York City 3, SFO 1, Amsterdam 2, and Amsterdam 3. So the idea was to have a nice spread in terms of latency. So this is also to kind of stress test the system, right? In real world, you're crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Packets are dropping. You're experiencing hundreds of milliseconds, sometimes thousands of milliseconds in latency. Can the system tolerate these kind of things, right? It's, it's no fun to do it over Vagrant, where you have zero milliseconds of routing time. And so then the goal was, can we do the C1K test, basically? Can we just submit 1,000 containers and see what happens, basically? Um, so that's what we did. So we submitted a job that had 1,000, what was it, Redis's, Nginx? I don't remember what the job even was, something like that. Uh, and the scheduler took less than a second, basically, by the time the benchmark script actually you know, pulled at every 100 milliseconds. It was already done. So it took less than a second for it to finish the scheduling of 1,000 containers to 400 machines. Uh, the first container booted within one second. 
So this was the one that happened to be in the same data center, right? New York City 3's latency was a lot faster than New York City 3 than Amsterdam. Uh, within six seconds, 95% of the containers had finished booting across the fleet. And at eight seconds, we had 99%. Uh, there's, you start seeing an extreme kind of tail latency at some point just because we were downloading from Docker Hub and one of them got hung up, who knows. Um, but effectively, the job was completed scheduling within about eight seconds uh, across, you know, going across, the, uh, going across the Atlantic, four different data centers, 1,000 containers. Uh, eight seconds is a pretty good rollout time. And so kind of in summary, as we were working on the system, these were the three really big points of focus for us, was can this be really easy for developers uh, so that it is the path, path of least resistance, right? Like we want it to offer kind of the most interesting features of like rolling upgrades, scaling up and down, like really easy to express arbitrary constraints like must run on Linux, must be 3.9 kernel, you know, so on and so forth. We want it really easy for them. Operationally, we wanted it to be really nice for operators as well. It should be able to be simple to run at effectively arbitrary scale without requiring a complex song and dance to make it actually work. And the last one was built for scale. Can we actually deliver a system that can handle 1,000 containers, 10,000 containers? We're hoping to do one where we try for a million containers and see what happens. And so that's Nomad. Uh, it's available at nomadproject.io. There's a lot more documentation. There's a getting started. Uh, I promise you can schedule a job within like four copy pastes into your terminal. Uh, so go play with it. And I will hand it back to Mitchell. Thanks. All right, cool. Um, so that was Nomad. Uh, I'm going to talk about auto instead. Uh, for better or worse, I'm not going to go into as much technical detail. I, uh, we both thought Nomad is more technically uh, interesting, so there's a lot more detail there. Auto, we're going to focus more on why it exists and, and, and sort of how you use it, because I think that is more confusing about auto versus something like Nomad. So what auto is, is the successor to Vagrant, um, which is kind of interesting because we made Vagrant, um, and we're slowly trying to replace it, um, but it doesn't replace Vagrant today. So um, we'll get into more detail of how it doesn't replace Vagrant today and how it does over time. Um, but uh, for now, this is the goal of Auto. Um, we have Vagrant releases coming out uh, for the foreseeable future. I tweeted today about like some pretty cool new features of Vagrant. So stuff's coming, um, but Auto's here. Um, so with Auto, what we did was we took a look at Vagrant and we thought, you know, what have we learned? Uh, Vagrant is six years old. The state of the world in six years, in, uh, the state in our world in six years changes a lot. So we took a look at how we're, we're now using microservices a lot more. There's a lot more containers. Um, people are scheduling things. Like it, the state of how applications are developed and run is very different. So we, we went from living in a runtime production ops focused world for the past three years all the way back to uh, Vagrant and developers and, and sort of questioned how can we make things better. So the three big things we saw in Vagrant um, or we learned from Vagrant is that one, development environment deviation is minimal. Uh, and what I mean by this is if, if, if like you two don't work in the same place and he's a Ruby developer uh, and he's a Ruby developer, then your Vagrant environments are going to be pretty similar. They're both going to have Ruby. They're both going to have Bundler. They're going to have a web server probably. Uh, they might change in some packages. Uh, he might be using MySQL. He might be using Postgres. Like there's little deviations, but most of it is similar. And being able to represent this in a Vagrant file is difficult uh, without repeating yourself. So it's likely instead that he has a Vagrant file that has all the same instructions of how to install stuff as he does. So um, we wanted a way to make that more dry, make that less, uh, less verbose. The second thing uh, is pretty obvious, uh, is developers want to deploy. It's the next step after all development is deploy. You don't work, most things, you don't work on your laptop, say that was cool, and like never want to show anybody. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, you want to deploy. And this was a feature request in Vagrant for its entire life. I mean, I think since Vagrant 0.1, uh, people have wanted to Vagrant up to production. And we tried at various points with Vagrant to make this a possibility. Um, but ultimately, what we learned is that the Vagrant file, uh, again, picking on the Vagrant file, just isn't the right way to describe how to go to production. It describes how to set things up onto a single machine. It describes how to install debugging type things. It doesn't set up monitoring. Um, it's just. It's just not the right level of abstraction for how to get to production in a way that's, that you would want to, in a best practices way. We certainly had internal demos where we could turn a Vagrant environment in, into an AWS instance, but it was just, it was just weird. It, just, it wasn't right. Um, so we wanted to do that. 
And then the last thing is microservices. So we're living in this world where this is still rel like super new. I mean, there, a lot of companies aren't doing microservices, but it's pretty clear to us um, that microservices are the future, breaking down monoliths into smaller applications. Maybe not microservices, but at least breaking them down into services is the way things are moving to or moving back to, if you want to think about SOA. But um, that's what's happening. And again, picking on the Vagrant file, which is not a great abstraction for microservices. We have multi-VM in, uh, in the Vagrant file, but it wasn't made for that. It was made to represent one big monolithic application talking to one big database or something. It wasn't meant to do a dozen different things. And, and even a modern laptop today struggles running like 12 VMs. That's really rough for your computer. So multi-VM wasn't the right abstraction. It wasn't built for that. Um, and yet microservices are here and are, are, are going to grow. So how do we build a dev tool that is friendly to microservices? So these are the three major things we saw with Vagrant. Um, and so to make them better, um, we built a successor to Vagrant. And the reason we did that versus trying to fix Vagrant itself is we thought that the Vagrant file was actually um, fundamentally not the right level of abstraction for the goals we wanted to achieve. We wanted to change things in a major way. Um, and bolting it onto Vagrant would have made things really terrible for current Vagrant users. Uh, and it wouldn't have made the optimal experience for the, the future. So um, we built something new. It's actually built on top of Vagrant. So Vagrant is six years old. It has a lot of wisdom. It has very few bugs that are, all the bugs it has are the weirdest edge cases. You know, it's like, I'm using Windows with this version of Hyper-V running this obscure operating system with Puppet and things don't work. It, they're really obscure. So the, the, the core of Vagrant is extremely stable. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel right off the bat. So we started with a very stable core of Vagrant and built Auto on top of it. So Auto is, is three things. So it's a development tool, a deployment tool, and a microservices management, or all, all that tool. Um, to make these three things possible, we made a new format called the app file. Um, and the app file, we believe, is the right level of abstraction uh, versus the Vagrant file. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about first. So um, just judging by the name, like you could already tell the app file is focusing on a different level. The app file is focusing on your app rather than the machine. The Vagrant file, the first thing you configure is a box. The first thing you tell Vagrant is how to install an operating system onto the machine. And, and, and I think that's a great like, philosophical difference between Auto and Vagrant. The first thing you tell Auto is what kind of application are you running? Is it Ruby? Is it something? Um, so it's different. Here's an example of, of an app file. Uh, it's, it's not wrong. It's actually intentionally blank. Um, and that's because. We went, we went all the way with the app file. The app file is completely optional. So um, whereas Vagrant, you off the bat have to tell it a bunch of things. When you run auto, it just looks at your application and says, it looks like a Ruby application. I'm just going to do what a Ruby application should do. Um, I see AWS environmental variables. I guess I'm using AWS. Like It detects and does things for you. Um, and we're going to get more into this, this intelligence a little bit later. Um, but the app file is a real format. So. Um, while it is optional, you can do things with it. So here's an example of a more complicated app file. Uh, it might look kind of similar to Nomad. Uh, at HashiCorp, we've sort of standardized on this config uh, format, um, which is JSON compatible. But um, this is what it looks like. So uh, I don't know if this thing works. Oh, cool. Um, so we have like an application. Uh, we tell it the name of the application, the type of it. Um, we could specify dependencies. So here's where microservices start to come in. We could actually tell uh, Auto that we depend on, in this case, Postgres. So we depend on something. And we'll explain what that means later. Um, and then we can make some customizations. So while we're, we're leaving out a lot of detail, you could still say, well, the Ruby version I really want is 2.1. I can't work with 2.2 or 2.0 or something. But, but all of this is optional. And you'll sort of notice right off the bat that a lot of things are missing that you might think are necessary. We're not telling it what operating system to run on. We're not telling it how much memory it needs. Uh, we're not telling it how to install Ruby. There's just a lot of stuff missing. And this is sort of a really fundamental difference between Vagrant and, and Auto. Um, the idea, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, so Vagrant, uh, Auto follows this idea of codification. And Vagrant, I would describe as a tool of fossilization. So the idea behind Vagrant is if you take a Vagrant file that you wrote five years ago, um, we've worked really hard to make sure that Vagrant file still works today. So you can Vagrant up a five-year-old Vagrant file. And if you do, it's going to spin up the same box. It's going to run the same set of commands. It's very, uh, as Armand uh, sort of described, it's not descriptive. It, it just says exactly what to do. And philosophically, we moved much more towards a descriptive model. So Vagrant is spinning something up the, identically as it would five years ago. It's a fossil. Um, when you created that Vagrant file five years ago, you snapshotted it. 
it's going to be that way for all time, for all eternity, it is a fossil. Whereas auto is, is not a fossil, so it's, it's codification, and more specifically, it's the centralization of knowledge out of the out of the config format and into the tool itself. So rather than in the config format being uh, uh, very specific about how to run things, it's declarative. It specifies intent rather than how to do things. I intend to deploy a Ruby application. I intend for it to be on this version of Ruby specifically. It needs these dependencies. It has its own description of how it wants to run. And auto itself is the intelligence that knows how to do that. If you run auto deploy today, it's going to deploy a very specific type of infrastructure set up service discovery a certain way, maybe use Docker, maybe use Nomad, but in five years, the state of the world changes. Maybe, maybe Nomad isn't the best way to do things. Maybe Docker's been replaced by unikernels. Uh, maybe AWS has uh, like burnt down and DigitalOcean replaced all of it. So, uh, <laughs> and, and so like the state, the best practice state of the world changed, and it's Otto's job to know what, y what the best practice is for the time and do that for you. So if you run Otto today, very different from if, if you run Otto tomorrow, but the end goal should be what you want. And the app file is supposed to describe that end goal. Um, and that's kind of a scary thought. It's a, it's a shift in, in, in a way to think, but at the same time, the reason Auto is open source is so that what you believe is best practices, you could help get in there. And one of the best ways I, I like to describe Auto is if you run Auto Infra and it sets up an AWS um, uh, infrastructure for you, if you choose to target AWS, then the person who designed that AWS, the way Auto creates that AWS infrastructure, was also the director of ops for the second largest, two years ago, the second largest AWS site in the world. So you just got the knowledge from the person who knows how to manage that level of AWS infrastructure for, <coughs> excuse me, for your hobby application, perhaps. Um, and this is sort of the power. Over time, we hope to get the best PHP developers, the best Ruby developers, the best Node developers, all contributing their knowledge and codifying it into Auto so that it does the best thing for you for your application and you also could contribute that. And so another concise way to say it is Auto's, Auto's pretty smart, and Auto's gonna get smarter. So if you run Auto, Auto Dev today to create a development environment, does something wrong, um, you could try to contribute the fix, or you could just wait a little bit and run Auto Dev in a month, and it hopefully will do the right thing. It got, it got a little bit smarter. Um, things will change. Um, but of course, it's pretty scary if every time you update Auto, it's doing something totally different. So, we have the concept of uh, fossilization in a way in, in auto to sort of restrict how often you change things. And this idea um, is app file compilation. So it ta auto takes the app file uh, and compiles it into a fossil. Um, and every time you recompile it, it might totally change something. So another way to describe auto is like a compiler. Um, so, <laughs> bless you. Uh, the first thing that happens when you use auto is you compile the app file. Um, this is the only time auto ever reads your app file, ever. So this is very different from Vagrant. This is actually something we learned from Vagrant 2, which is when you run Vagrant up, when you run any Vagrant command, it read your Vagrant file. So if you run Vagrant up and suddenly change the box, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you have done, when you run another Vagrant command, it's the same box. It doesn't go back and change it. Like, it's the same, and, uh, you, but you want it to change and you can't detect it. There's sort of all sorts of problems. Auto instead very documents that compiles the only time it'll ever read your app file. If you make any change to the app file at all, um, it won't take effect until you recompile. Uh, and so if you update auto at all, it won't, no changes will take effect until you recompile. It's very much like an application source and binary. So uh, in this case, we load the app file, um, which may or may not exist. Again, it's, it's optional. Um, it detects a bunch of things and starts creating stuff. So we ran autocompile on our vault project, and it doesn't have an app file, uh, and this is what it detected. So it detected it's a Go project, um, it detected it wants, we want to put it on AWS. It compiled a bunch of stuff um, and, and we're done. So what does it mean? What did this just do? So if you look, it created a dot auto directory, which doesn't go into uh, version control. And if you were to look at this directory, you'll see a bunch of stuff. And you'll see actually like it created 49 files. And it's a compiler. So what it actually did was it generated Vagrant files, a bunch of different Vagrant files. It generated scripts, upstart configurations, um, a lot of stuff is missing. It generates Packer files. It generates Terraform files. It generates all the low-level configuration for the other tools we've built in order to do what they do well. So Terraform is, Auto uses Terraform to start servers. Auto uses uh, parts of Vagrant um, in order to manage the development environment. Those parts are changing over time. Um, uses Packer to build the Docker containers, the machine images. Um, it keeps those being single-purpose tools of what they do. And auto just auto manages them, and it also installs them for you. So you don't even need to know how to install them. It just does things. Um, 
And if you think about it in one way, when, when you look at this, a lot of people that first run compile and look at what dot auto, what's in dot auto, it's like, I just, by running one command, didn't have to write 49 files. Like, it wrote the 49 files for me. And that's really sort of the power in auto. Um, and, and you could see how, like, if it generated a vagrant file, and, which is a fossil, and you were to update auto, and you didn't recompile, it's going to run the same vagrant command. So you're going to get that consistency. Um, when you recompile, it might change the vagrant file. Uh, and future versions of auto handle that migration for you. So if you've already deployed something and you run auto compile, then it's going to generate the migration steps towards its future. Um, it doesn't do that today because it's never changed yet, um, but that's what it's going to do. Uh, so yeah, this, this, this sort of better explains why auto's around all these things. It's using all these things under the covers. We didn't reinvent the wheel. Um, we're just simplifying sort of the whole dev to production process. Yeah, so that's fossilization. So let's just take a look at what auto looks like for development to start. It is, of course, meant to be the successor to Vagrant, so it should have a development experience that uh, is uh, better, if not equal, to Vagrant. So Vagrant has Vagrant up, auto has auto dev. They're effectively the same. Vagrant up gives you a development environment in one command. Auto dev gives you a development environment in one command. It looks like this. Um, it, you could see Vagrant's in here, um, which seems kind of weird if it's meant to be the successor to Vagrant, but like I said, we built on top of it. So um, we, we, we use Vagrant to orchestrate the development environment process underneath, but we add a lot on top of it. So we do fancy things with auto like cache the SSH credentials. Uh, this is pretty nice because if you've run Vagrant SSH, you probably know it takes like two or three seconds in order to actually enter the machine. Auto, S auto dev SSH takes about 100 milliseconds. Like it's really fast because we cache credentials because auto is the only entrance way to Vagrant. We know you're not messing with the environment. We know the IP hasn't changed. We're going to do it fast. Um, the next version of auto, actually what I was working on today, actually uses link clones and layers underneath. So auto dev today takes a normal Vagrant uptime, which is perhaps like a minute or something. Uh, auto dev in 0.2, my goal is to make it take five seconds. Um, so you get, you get development environments really, really fast. Um, and, and that process is just going to improve. So auto dev uh, might feel a lot like Vagrant today, but in the coming months, it's just going to get better and better and better, and we're doing sort of fancy things. The other thing we do is we assign an IP address for you. So with Vagrant, you have to make the decision of how do I network? What IP do I give it? Auto, we look at your network interfaces. We find the one that doesn't conflict with anything. We choose an IP that works for you. We choose an IP that no other application is using, uh, and we allocate it. The next version of Auto actually allocates a DNS name, so you could reference everything with DNS names. Do you, you see how things are just getting better and better. Um, and then the last thing you'll notice just down here is this is just human friendly. Um, this whole bottom part is totally uh, I, like tailored for your application, in this case a Ruby application, and Auto is telling you as in human friendly terms how to work with that application. It's saying, by the way, Ruby's pre-installed to work on the project, edit files, the file changes will be synced. When you're ready to build, use SSH. Bundler Ruby is already in there. Uh, you can access it using this IP. And if you ran this with Go, if you ran this with Node, it'd be different output. Um, someone already added, someone that works at HashiCorp actually already added Rails detection. So not only will we detect as Ruby, but we'll detect as Rails. Um, and we automatically set up databases for you. We migrate, we, we seed the database for you. And that's in the output. It says, by the way, I already seeded the database. Here's the username, here's the password. It gives you a bunch of stuff. And, and it's getting smarter already. So you can run autodev SSH. Uh, that'll be 100 milliseconds, like I said. You're in a vagrant environment, which is kind of funny, but you are. Um, and that's just how easy that is. Uh, you could get the address using one command. You could destroy using one command. It's very similar to vagrant right now. Um, and, we're, and we did that on purpose. You're comfortable with vagrant. We're not trying to totally like change your world. Um, yeah. So I think at the end, what we've created is a really nice development experience. I think it's going to get a lot better. Um, and and I'm excited for it. So of course we did development, so now let's try to get to deployment, let's try to get to production. This is new, Vagrant doesn't do this, so we're in uncharted territory. How do we make this, this uh, experience as nice uh, as Vagrant? Uh, so first of all, if you're deploying, uh, let's, let's talk about what happens. So uh, everyone in here is probably like an amazing developer ops person, so this is not what you do, you just know what to do. But if, you, if, you're, if you're like, the long tail of most developers, um, you'll just Google, especially if it's your first time. If you're working with Rails, let's use Rails as an example, you Google, how do I deploy a Rails application? Um, I Googled this a week ago. This was the result. And the top results really uh, doesn't say anything useful, um, interestingly enough. Uh, it's, it has no, no useful information. But the second one, 
The, the second one here actually is, lo, sounds perfect. Like, how to deploy a Rails app with Passenger and Apache on, like, dot, dot, dot. That sounds exactly like what I want. Um, so you click that, and you get something like this. Um, and this is pages and pages. So you get stuff like this, which is copying and pasting commands into a terminal. And, and the f I, you kind of like, if you've been doing DevOps or something, you sort of laugh at this because this wasn't a best practice 15 years ago. And it's still, you know, despite the innovation we've had in that time, it's still the top hit. And so you, you sort of, you have to ask yourself, I, we asked ourselves why, why is this the most popular result? Why is this the top hit? And so what you'd actually want is what is the current best practice? So instead of this, you want the best practice, and this is the best practice. So you want to set up a, you know, a private subnet, a public subnet. You want to hide your services that don't need internet, uh, external to internal internet access in the private subnet, your databases, your services, your web servers. You want to make a public subnet with a load balancer that routes back there. You want a bastion or jump host in order to get into there. You want a NAT so they can reach out to the internet. And you, this is what you want. This is the best practice. Whether you know it or not, this is what you want. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is this is super complex. Like this, no, if, if you go ask some recent graduate of any sort of computer education uh, what, how they would deploy an application, uh, this is not what they would come up with. Uh, but experience has told us that this is sort of the best foundation with which to deploy things. It gives you the best ability to grow. It gives you sort of the best minimum security, like that sort of stuff. But the problem is this is super, super complex. And, and even the best uh, operators, it takes time to do this. Uh, and the, to automate this away, you have to learn other tools. And, and we've built a lot of those tools, Terraform, Console, Packer. Uh, but now you're asking somebody to learn a whole other set of tools which they don't want to be their expertise. They want to be a, a really great Rails developer. They don't want to be a really great Terraform Packer console person. Uh, there are those people which are great, but uh, this person doesn't want to be that. So that's why this is the top result, because despite all the innovation we've made, despite how much we've made things better, or we believe we've made things better, this is still so much easier than anything else out there. So might as well just copy and paste things ev in there because even if you have to blow away the server and recreate it, this is still faster than learning a, do a half dozen different tools. And so we wanted to change that uh, with auto. So. so with auto, we've split this process into three commands. Uh, in future versions, it'll probably be even less. Um, we're probably going to make it even easier. Um, but there's auto infra, auto build, and auto deploy. So auto manages your complete infrastructure. So running auto infra actually um, creates that diagram. It actually creates a private subnet, public subnet, creates a bastion uh, or jump host, creates a NAT, automatically configures them, sets up security group rules, sets up everything for you. So you don't need to know. And like I said, that infrastructure, infrastructure was designed um, by somebody who did this at, at larger scale than most people ever see. Um, so you're getting a lot of wisdom in that. Auto has different options. Like I just described a minimum of maybe three servers, and maybe you don't want to pay that much. So auto has different options to say, uh, sacrifice scalability for costs, and let's just throw everything on one server in a public subnet and try to lock things down more with security groups. It has that option, uh, and more will come with it. Uh, DO is coming in the next release. So it, over time, it'll also learn like more infrastructure providers as well. Um, so you could say, DO is just a lot cheaper um, for what I need, so let's go to DO, or I have credits from Google, so let's just use Google. Um, Auto is able to target different things. Like I said, the app file doesn't say what cloud provider you want, so it gives you that flexibility of jumping around. Um, the next step is to build. So the build process takes your source code and turns it into something deployable. This might be a container. This might be uh, at the machine level of like a droplet base image. It's, it's meant to build, make something deployable. And what it makes is sort of up to auto. Uh, right now, in the current release, it builds AMIs. Um, we built auto and Nomad in parallel. So the goal is actually with, in very soon, probably not 0.2, but very soon in auto's life cycle, everything it's going to build is going to be something that Nomad can run. And we're just going to defer to Nomad. But again, that's, that's best practices evolving. We built auto when there are schedulers, but we, there were no schedulers that were easy enough to automate the operation of. So um, we built auto in a world where, in our world, where uh, machine images were still easier. So it uses machine images, but you're going to update auto, and suddenly it's going to use a scheduler. You're going to get way more density. Your costs are going to drop, and all you had to do is download a new binary. <laughs> and, uh, and the last thing is auto deploy. So that sort of does what you expect. It, it deploys it. Um, You'll see what this looks like in a second. I have an output somewhere. Um, 
So that's how easy that is, and it's going to get easier. I think, and I think in the next version, all you have to run is this, and it'll automatically be easy. Um, but, but these are separate because you can actually share infrastructure between multiple app files. So you can actually have one, uh, one infrastructure, and then you can deploy a bunch of apps on top of that infrastructure that other developers are doing. Um, so these are why these are separate. For now. Um, and then the last thing on the deployment is microservices. So um, microservices are coming up, and we're going from this monolith world with a lot of big pieces in, in, a, in a single single box to a lot of little pieces. Yes. So uh, Vagrant hasn't really worked very well at all for microservices. And in production, uh, you need to set up more things: monitoring, service discovery, um, service configuration, more security stuff. So it, it's just really complicated. And the thing that makes it complicated is all these like connections between them. It's hard to uh, succeed. Uh, I can't say that word. So it's it's hard to like uh, efficiently describe um, all your dependencies and be able to manage them in a scalable way. And what people are doing today, when we looked at microservices today, um, I don't think even outside of Vagrant, I don't think anyone who uses microservices would disagree when I say that they are complicated to develop and deploy. Um, and the reason is because if you look at what people are doing for for development today, let's say they're using Docker, you create a Docker compose file which. Um, has every container you need in it, but it doesn't just have your immediate dependencies, it has everything they depend on. So you end up with a Docker file that it's up to that one developer to have the full transitive list of dependencies, know how to configure it, know what version to install, um, all, start them all in parallel, all that stuff. Um, and then deployment, you have to know what order to launch them in, um, how they find each other, it's just sort of a, a whole new bag of worms. So we wanted to solve that. And so with Auto, what we ended up doing is looking at that app file we had, was creating this dependency thing. Um, and you could specify a bunch of these. So if you have a, a bunch of dependencies, you just repeat that. And what we did was we set up pointers. So instead of, instead of having a Docker compose file where you need to know how to install everything, uh, the app file is a perfect abstraction for that. The app file describes, app file plus auto describes what you want and how to install it. So let's put the burden of telling auto how to install something onto the developer of that service. It should be their responsibility to make this happen. So that's what this does. You just point to the dependency you need. Um, this could be on Git, Bitbucket, even HTTP, stuff like that. Um, you just point to it, and auto during the compilation process fetches these app files, fetches their dependencies for you, so you don't need to know that, and automatically figures out the ordering and how to set everything up based on these app files. Um, yeah, so pointers. So here's what it looks like if uh, I was running that app file. If you run auto dev, um, create a development environment, you, you'll actually start seeing messages like installing dependency Postgres. That app file described how to install it. Auto does that for you. Um, it also configures it in console for you so that you can find it via service discovery. Auto, auto automatically installs console and manages that distributed system for you, so you don't need to know how to. Um, and then it creates it, and it puts all of this into one virtual machine. So um, this is very similar to if you were running like Docker or something. Uh, you usually run like one boot to Docker machine, run Docker Compose, and there's a bunch of containers on there. Vagrant multiplexes all your dependencies, your whole microservice graph down onto one, uh, one virtual machine. Uh, exposes everything through console, um, and, and you're sort of off, off to the races. If you SSH in, you could actually see. So we SSH'd in, uh, ran DNS lookup, and we got some results. So all that stuff's there automatically. You didn't know, need to know how to configure it. You didn't know how to put in seed data, any of that stuff. It's up to the dependency to tell auto for development how to set all that up. Uh, and if you were to deploy, this is not useful output, but if you were to deploy, it actually will deploy it, will deploy all the dependencies. Um, Auto currently will deploy just one of each dependency, like a singleton. Um, eventually, you'll be able to say, I want multiple distinct copies, and stuff like that. But for now, it just deploys one of each. And if you were to actually run auto deploy on a folder with no app file with Ruby that depends on Postgres, you would actually get a Postgres machine configured, uh, the Rails, uh, the, the Ruby application deployed behind Fusion Passenger, um, service discovery set up to find the database. Uh, you would get credentials injected into the environmental variables. Uh, eventually, we'll automatically integrate console template. Um, and it, it just all sort of works. And you could think that that just happened with uh, zero lines of configuration, a few commands, uh, and um, just a credit card for AWS. Um, and it's going to get smarter. So we already have plans for auto deploy to automatically set up Vault for you, to set up Nomad for you. Um, to store secrets for you, to give you access to those secrets easily, um, all that stuff. So you could just redeploy, redeploy, and, and auto is going to get better and better. And 
I don't know what else. Yeah, so what Auto is is a development tool, a deployment tool, and a microservices tool all sort of configured with this one app file, which, which sort of we think is the right way to think about things. It, we've, we've spent six years building these low-level tools to work with um, machines and, uh, and images and things like that, and we're trying to sort of move up to a higher level um, of abstraction to, to make us all more productive. And so Auto is sort of our way forward. Um, it doesn't replace Vagrant um, for a lot of things. We think that over the next three years, uh, my hope is that 90 plus percent of developers using Vagrant move to auto. It becomes good enough to move to, to auto. Um, but Vagrant never gets replaced for machine level stuff. Like if you're testing provisioning at a machine level, if you're working with obscure operating systems, if you're trying to model weird environments, Vagrant doesn't get replaced. So we're still developing and working on Vagrant. Um, but but auto is going to get better and better every day. And I think that eventually, very similar to when, uh, not that I was uh, alive, but very similar to when compilers uh, came out for, for things like C or, or earlier languages, when we, when we moved from assembly to higher level programming languages, there were sort of a lot of assembly developers which were like, well, I could do it better in assembly. I have more control in assembly. It could be better. Um, I think auto is going to be at that stage for a while, which is a lot of, a lot of people are like, well, if I control Packer and I control Terraform, I could do things better. And it's probably not, uh, it's probably not uh, wrong today. You're probably right that you could do it better. But we're hoping that those people contribute to auto to make it smarter. And eventually, you get to the point where you auto compile. You look at the Terraform output. You look at all the things it did, automatic service discovery, um, security, scheduling, um, automatic density calculations, automatically choosing the, the most efficient cloud for your workload. And you're going to look at it, and you're going to think, I could not have done this better. Um, and, and that's the goal of auto. Uh, so you could find it at autoproject.io. already exists. It's been released for a week. Um, and this is now has surpassed Vault as our fastest growing project. It, Vault got three th vanity metric. Vault got three thousand stars in a month. Uh, Auto's gotten three thousand in six days. So, uh, we're, we're we're speeding up, uh, and that's Auto, and uh, that's it. So thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching this. I know it's long. <laughs> cool. And. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you want to ask questions here or you just want to talk later. I don't know. Okay. What kind of dependencies do you expect for auto installation? Do you expect any Linux kernel configuration uh, where a developer can install directly auto? Uh, auto runs on anything. Itself runs on anything. What it deploys right now is Ubuntu. Um, and auto is meant to be best practices. So we're not going to try to have auto support every operating system in the world. We're probably going to go, at least in the early versions, we're going to go with Ubuntu and like rel-like flavors. And we'll see. It's, it's meant to be best practices. So like if you want to if you want to deploy a full Nix-based OS like deployment, I'm not saying Nix is bad. It's just it's just not pragmatic today in terms of like it's not widespread. There's not a lot of resources, so that's not what Auto is going to do today. Yep. Yep, that's a great question. Um, uh, so today, not in a good way, but we completely planned for that. So um, the way Auto is going to work for production is that Git GitHub flow. It's it's you. Yeah, you You'll want to sign up with Atlas, and and yeah, and very, well, I mean, it, it's Auto provides you the tools to work on a team. It's just, it's sort of like you could, in theory, get pull from everybody's machine, right? But you, GitHub just gives you a nicer experience. Um, we're building Auto, so in in theory, you can work with a team using what it has. But Atlas is just going to give you a lot nicer experience for that. Uh, any other questions? Any questions for Nomad? All right, well, cool. We're going to stick around a little while, so thanks for having us again.